Alrighty, so welcome to Take a Bite Out of Science. Um, take, a bite of, take a Bite Out of Science is our Lunch and Learn lecture series where we talk for about a half hour on some of our research and some of our educational programs. Um, these are meant to be bite-sized events where we make science a little bit more digestible. So today we are going to be joined with Melissa, um, our Education and Outreach Director who's going to be talking to us about the three sharps. Um, so this lecture is a free lecture that's part of our free virtual series, and we'd like to thank Zap for funding these along with our generous supporters. So with that, um, I'm gonna pass it over to Melissa. the little mute symbol up in the corner. There we go. Thank you, Sammy. <laughs> so hello, everyone. I'm sorry to steal you away from our beautiful Caloris, the red-tailed hawk, but we will definitely come back to him in a little while. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the three sharps. If you watched our last Take a Bite Out of Science um, presentation with Dr. Dave Oliar, he really talked about what makes a raptor a raptor and how do you tell if a rap if a bird is a raptor or if it's some other bird that has some raptor like characteristics and one of the things he mentioned is what we call the three sharps and this is really kind of some traits three traits that we see in common in almost every raptor species now there's always somebody who breaks the rules a little bit so we'll talk about that today as well but as we go into these um, keep in mind that even though all raptors have the three sharps not every raptor is going to use them the same way or they're going to have variations among those to help them in either the environment where they live or with the type of food that they eat. So we're gonna explore some of those variations um, as, we, as we look at the sharps today. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are bird folks, raptor folks, so you probably already know what the sharps are. So this is not gonna be uh, surprising content for you. But for those of you who maybe are new, um, I'm going to show you some pictures and then we'll kind of put it together as we go along of like what these three sharps are. So when most people think of raptors, the first thing that they really start to think about are its feet or its, or its talons, the claws. Um, one of the things that really distinguishes raptors from other birds that hunt or that are predatory is that they use their feet to hunt instead of their bill. So when you think of a bird like a penguin or a robin or something like that that is eating fish or insects or even other mammals, um, most of those birds catch and kill those animals with their bills. Raptors, as you can see in this little image here, um, they are a little different. They do not use their bills to catch their food. Generally speaking, they use their feet. So this is kind of what people think of when they think of a raptor is this really powerful foot full of sharp talons um, that is meant for seizing and grabbing prey. Now, for those who aren't birding experts, and I probably include myself in that group, like I am still learning. Um, as an educator, I feel like it's important to always be learning. So that's what I try and do. This is an osprey. So an osprey is a type of raptor that you'll often find near water. And so if we look closely at the talons in this image, you're gonna see that they are adapted for the osprey's favorite food, which is fish. So if you look at the feet, you might notice there's some little bumpy texture on the bottom of those feet. Those are called sphericals. Um, and they're actually on these osprey are kind of extra grippy, almost like a Velcro. And if you think about trying to catch a slippery fish, um, that is the perfect texture and surface to help you hold on. Now, that's obviously secondary to the osprey's 
most powerful tool for catching fish, which is those long curved talons. Now there's been some studies on different birds of prey and their talons, and uh, they actually have measured sort of the, the length of the talon, the width, the curvature, like the actual curve, um, and different talons are suited for different purposes. So the ospreys have particularly curvy talons. As you can see, those are especially good for catching and holding on to fish. Um, another adaptation that you'll see around the osprey's talons and legs are that it's tarsi, which are the, the leg just above where the talon is. You can see there's not feathering all the way down to those talons. Um, that is to help the osprey reduce drag when it's in the water. If it's catching a fish, obviously its feet are gonna get wet. So having less feathering on its tarsi or its legs helps it to um, not get dragged down by the weight of that extra water getting in its feathers. So that is one example of a way that raptors have adapted to use their talons. Um, let's look at another one. This is one of my favorite types of raptor. Um, I, uh, if you wanted to make a guess in the chat what kind of raptor feet these are, I bet a lot of you already know. Um, you'll notice, I'm gonna flip back for a minute, that this osprey kind of has three toes in front and one big toe in the back. Um, but the osprey and this bird actually share a feature that is, is kind of unique and helps them catch their prey. And that is that they have the ability to move one of those front toes either to the back or to the front. So in this image, what you're seeing are two toes in front and two toes in back, which is really ideal for perching in a tree, um, for hanging on, maybe if it's a windy day or something. Um, it's really a designed for comfort in standing for a long period of time. But if this bird is hunting and it needs to have a little more uh, traction on its prey, it can rotate that outside toe to the front and it can go ahead and seize that prey. Now I'm going to tell you what the bird is. If you haven't already guessed, these are the feet of a great horned owl. And as you can see here, unlike the osprey, the feathering goes all the way down to the tips of those talons. Um, owls in general have fluffy feet that are feathered all the way down. Um, it serves a couple of purposes. Mostly um, owls live oftentimes in various climates. Um, so if it gets cold, it's another way to keep that bird warm. Owls have uh, lots and lots of feathers. They actually have four layers of feathers on their body. Um, and that does help them stay warm, but they serve an even more important purpose for owls. Um, unlike the osprey, who is going to kind of uh, hunt his prey with speed, owls tend to be ambush predators. So they want to be silent as possible. And so they have some special adaptations that help them to do that. And one of them is having all these extra feathers. And not only do they have extra feathers, but they have, if I can see if I can get my owl feather out here. Um, if you look at an owl's feather really closely, and I'll see if I can zoom in on this as close as I, oh, that's more of me than you wanna see. But I don't know if you can see the edge of this feather is fringed, kind of like a comb. So if I were to, um, were to model it with my hand, so like a normal feather might be tight like this, an owl's feather has fringy edges like this. So all those little fringes make an air current when the owl flaps its wings. And every feather that has that fringe distributes that air current. So the more air current swirling around that feather, the quieter it is. And so owls have, uh, you'll notice shorter talons and thicker toes. Um, they have really strong feet that they're one of the predators that raptors that will actually really asphyxiate or crush their prey. Um, if the prey is small enough, they tend to eat it whole. So they really want to make sure it's dead before they put it in their mouth. <laughs> you don't want to try and swallow a struggling mouse or other rodent or reptile. Um, now, of course, owls can hunt bigger prey too. So that's not always the case. But if it's a smaller animal, then they will use those really strong, powerful toes to, to end that life and, and eat it. Um, there have been some studies that show that, that some large owls, like really large 
great horned owls or some of the eagle owls have a grip strength or power in their feet that is comparable to an eagle. So even though they may be smaller in size, they have very strong feet for their size. And um, that you can see that reflected in those big thick toes. So here's another raptor foot. Um, again, if you wanna try and guess in the chat, you can. Uh, you'll notice that these toes are very different from the last ones we saw. They're quite skinny. Um, the middle toe is really long compared to the other two. And this one does have the three toes in front, one toe in back configuration. Um, you can see that the talons are not nearly as long or as curved as they are on, say, the osprey. In fact, compared to some of the other bird species, raptor species, these talons might seem a little bit smallish. Um, and so why would this bird that's a raptor have talons like that? Well, this bird specializes in speed. They are really good at catching things with direct pursuit. So instead of ambushing like an owl, um, they will actually chase down their prey um, and they will strike it at a very high speed. And so I'm going to give you a big clue if you haven't already guessed what kind of bird this is. Um, most raptors will hunt with an open foot and they grab their prey. This is a bird that balls its foot up and that extra long toe sticks out and actually makes kind of a pressure point and they hit their prey with a closed foot. So if you haven't guessed by now, this is a peregrine falcon foot. So you can see here, again, this bird has talons, but its talons are different than other raptors and they use them in a different way. So peregrine falcons are the fastest animal on the planet. Um, we have documented cases of them going over 200 miles per hour. So you can imagine they hunt birds. If you're a little bird and something hits you at 200 miles an hour, you know, like a punch, um, you're probably gonna not last very long. So if that doesn't kill them outright, it often stuns them and then the peregrine can either catch that prey right out of the air or they'll go down to the ground and, and finish off the bird on the ground. So we have all these different talons that raptors share and we can see that even though many all the raptors have sort of these talon adaptations, they use them in different ways and they are really shaped by what they like to eat, how they like to hunt and where they tend to live. Um, in this image, you have a golden eagle that's being held by that person um, on the on my left side. I think it's your left side as well. And then the one with the fist, that's a harpy eagle. So that's one of the largest species of raptors. And you can really see there how powerful those talons are. Those are birds that hunt large mammals. So they have to be pretty tough and pretty strong to contend with that. So even though these are both eagles, you have the golden eagle still has really long um, curved talons, but they're more slender versus the harpy eagle that's got um, really thick, powerful talons. And I don't know who this guy is that has his fist in the harpy eagle's talons, but I would not um, follow his example if it were me. <laughs> He's a brave man. So let's talk about the next sharp. So the next sharp um, is the bill of a raptor. And so we think of raptors as having these hooked bills. Um, there are other birds that have hooked bills. We know like parrots, for example, have a very strong hooked bill. And in fact, a much stronger bite than most, than most raptor species. I would much rather be bitten by a hawk or, or a falcon than I would by a parrot if I had to choose. Um, but obviously they use those in different ways. Um, parrots have that strong bite force because they need to open nuts and seeds and fruits and things like that. Raptors bills, because they aren't the main tool for capturing their prey, are really designed for getting into it once the animal is already dead. But even among that, raptors have some special adaptations. So this is a young ferruginous hawk um, and these guys live in territory that is occupied by other large raptors, golden eagles, great horned owls, um, other predators that may want to steal their kill. 
And so they are known for having a very large gape, which means how wide their mouth can open. And they have this adaptation so that they can swallow or eat their prey really quickly because it's much harder to steal once it's inside of them. Um, they even have it, and this is found in a lot of different raptor species, but most raptors have a, a pretty undeveloped tongue. These guys have a bigger tongue and you can see they have these kind of prongs on the sides of their tongue that point backwards, which again is, a, is an adaptation that helps them to quickly uh, swallow and, and eat their food. So those prongs kind of help force that food back down into their, into their mouths. So that's one way that they have a different adaptation for their bill. This bird, again, I'll do the, the guessing game. You guys can put in the chat if you know what this is. Um, this is a, one of the lesser known raptors. It's not one that we have here in the West, um, but it is a, a really endangered species that um, we're working, you know, raptor partners are working hard to, to save and conserve. It's really suffering because of habitat loss. Um, this is a bird that specializes in eating a very interesting food source. Now, if you watched the last uh, Take a Bite Out of Science with Dr. Oliar, um, he talked about one of the characteristics of raptors is that their diet primarily seems to be vertebrates. Um, that's not always the case. Obviously, there's, like I said, there's exceptions to every rule. Um, there's some owls, small owls that are primarily insectivores. And this raptor is a real specialist. It eats really only one kind of food source. And so that's one of the reasons why it's endangered and why it's struggling is because, you know, it's got to find its food. And if there's not enough food, then they're in trouble. So this is a snail kite. Um, you can see here that it's got a very slender bill that's really good for opening up and getting into these big aquatic freshwater snails that it preys on. Um, here's another one of my very favorite raptors. This is a turkey vulture. Um, and vultures, again, break a lot of the raptor rules, right? Like he has a hooked beak, but it's not nearly as dramatic a hook as some of the other raptors. He has feet with some claws or talons on the end, but they're not very big and they don't capture their food with them because vultures, of course, are, are uh, eat dead things, are carrion eaters. So he does have a really cool adaptation built in though to that bill. You can see that you can see all the way through his nares or his nostrils. And that's because turkey vultures are one of the very few birds of prey that have a sense of smell. And they actually have a pretty acute sense of smell, which makes sense if you eat dead things that you can smell them. Um, and so that's an adaptation that this bird has that is totally unique among most raptor species. And so again, with bills, they come, um, they're all kind of have that same hooked shape, but they come in different sizes and different formats and kind of achieve different things for different raptors. So our last sharp is vision. Um, a lot of people talk about eagle-eyed or sharp vision of a raptor. Well, you know, that kind of depends on which bird you're talking about and what the circumstances are. Um, raptors, what I will say, I think is the, the way to think about it is vision is a really important sense for them. It's their primary sense used for hunting. That makes sense if you're flying high up in the sky, unless you're a turkey vulture, it's gonna be hard to smell anything and you're probably not gonna be able to hear very well up there. So your sight is gonna be really important. But again, different raptors have uh, excellent vision in different ways. So owls, for example, in the daytime, their visual acuity is pretty similar to ours as human beings. Um, they don't see resolution or detail much better than we do in bright light conditions. But at night, that's really where things start to change. As you reduce the amount of light available, um, humans quickly fall off that scale. And in certain um, levels of light that are pretty low, owls can see approximately 10 times better than a human. So they have the ability to see a lot of contrast in shades of gray that really helps them see in the dark. Um, this is a griffin vulture. It's an old world vulture from uh, Africa and Southern Europe and, and that part of the world. These guys have some of the best visual acuity in the world. So now we're talking about um, what we traditionally think of as like the sharp eagle eye or the raptor vision. Um, there's been some science work done that kind of demonstrates that the, 
the vision of a raptor like this, like a griffin vulture or some of the eagles, some of the larger raptors, is equivalent to 25 vision. So what that means is as a human, if I have 20, 20 vision, I can see something from 20 feet away with the same amount of detail as the average human can. So what I can see in, in detail from five feet away, these guys can see from 20 feet or more away, depending on the species. So that's where the kind of traditional uh, excellent vision that you think of for raptors is kind of an example here. But the, again, in low light conditions, these guys are really adapted to see during the day. So they actually cannot see as well as we can in low light conditions. So it's hard to say raptors see better than humans because it really depends on the circumstances. But in general, they really rely on that vision to hunt. Um, this is a Harris hawk. These guys are found in the southwest part of the United States. And one thing we've learned about them is that they have the ability to see far more colors than we can as human beings, um, and even more than other raptors. So they have the ability to distinguish lots of different colors. And if you think about, they tend to live in desert environments where their prey may be camouflaged to look very much like their surrounding environment. Um, so that can be really helpful to them in sort of figuring out what's the prey and what's the background that that prey is camouflaging into. So sight, again, is really important for raptors. So we have our, our talons, we have our um, curved bill and our sight, which is how they all kind of come together. But all those adaptations, that package of three adaptations that's evolved over and over again in different species around the world um, will still vary within those kind of broad categories to really help raptors survive in their unique environments. So I want to give you an example of, um, of these things in a real bird. So I'm going to go back to our friend Caloris here. So Caloris is a red-tailed hawk. He is one of, well, he is the oldest raptor ambassador here at Hawkwatch. You probably wouldn't ever see him out on a program in the general public because this guy came to us in 1992. So if you do your math in your head really quick, um, keep in mind that when he was found in a barbed wire fence, he already had his red tail, which meant he had his adult plumage. So he had to be at least a year old. Um, he had to have gone through a full molt from his first year in order to get that red tail. So Caloris is around 31 years old. We aren't positive. We're kind of looking into it, but he may be one of the oldest red tail hawks ever. So we're trying to investigate that and see. And he's still doing pretty well, but we figure he's earned his retirement from, from general programs. But um, I love being able to use him for programs like this one um, because... It, you know, he doesn't get out very much anymore. So you can see here are Caloris's talons. They're a little dirty because he's a messy eater. Um, he's having rats for lunch today, in case you're wondering, since we were asking that earlier. So he's got really the classic raptor talons, three in front, one big talon in the back called the hallux. Um, Red-tailed hawks are really common in the Western United States. They're one of the larger budios or soaring hawks. And they hunt mostly mammals, but they'll also eat uh, ro reptiles like snakes and things. Um, they can even take something as large as a rabbit. So you can see those talons are really meant for holding on to prey. If they're killing something as large as a rabbit, they're probably not going to be able to kill it instantly um, the way an owl could catching a very small mouse. So their talons are designed to kind of grip in and hang on to that animal until it submits to the point where they can start eating. Let's take a look at Caloris's beautiful face here. So you can see he's got that classic curved raptor beak. Um, so if the talons are kind of like the fork that he's using to hold down his meal, that beak is kind of like the knife that he uses to carve it up into little pieces. Um, he can use that to tear through the, the thick hide of that animal and pull out all the delicious gooey insides that he loves to eat. And then you'll also notice his big eyes. So Caloris does have an excellent sense of sight. 
Um, he can see really, really far away. He can see in high detail, especially in bright light. And so one of the things about raptors, because their vision is so important, they tend to have really big eyes. And he looks, his, he's pretty fluffy. He's got lots of feathers. But if you were to take those off, his skull is pretty small in there. And once you account for the fact that his eyes are actually kind of tube shaped, so they're long and go deep into that eye, um, it kind of leaves not a ton of room for brains. So raptor, I'm not saying that raptors aren't intelligent. Of course, they are fully capable of surviving and doing what they need to do. But they are not the most intelligent of birds. Um, if you look at something like a crow or a raven or a parrot, they'll have a much larger brain for the size of their body um, compared to something like a raptor. So Caloris is a beautiful example of all three of those sharps together. Um, Red-tailed hawks are kind of the, the classic raptor in my mind. When I think of a raptor, I usually think of something like a red-tailed hawk. So I want to make sure we have time for a couple questions. I know we're just about out of time. So I will let Sammy refer those to me. And I'm just going to put you back on Caloris because he's a lot more interesting to look at than I am. Alrighty, so we only have one question so far, and the question is, is there a difference between bills and beaks? So that's a great question. Technically, it really honestly, I'm going to say, it will depend on which scientist or person you ask and how particular they are. But in reality, they're interchangeable. A bill and a beak are really the same thing. Um, some people are really adamant that you should say bill. Some people feel like beak is more appropriate. But um, generally speaking, the some of the raptor experts we've worked with prefer bill. So that's the word we use. But it's interchangeable. There's no, uh, there's no problem with calling it a beak. Okay, our next question is, is it true that owls cannot move their feet once they catch their prey? So I don't, I've never heard that in particular. What I will say is that owls have a special tendon in their, a mechanism in the tendons in their feet that kind of ratchet it down and lock it in. So think of like one of those zip ties, you know, the little plastic where you, you put the tail of the zip tie through the little square piece and then you pull it tight and you can't pull it backwards. Obviously owls can't, that wouldn't be permanent because then what would the owl do? It could never open its feet again. So it is, it is an adaptation that they have, um, but I do believe they are capable of relaxing that at, at will. So it may be that they tend to keep their feet closed for a while because of that until they're sure the prey is dead. But um, I think it would be pretty difficult for an owl if it couldn't open its feet again after it caught something. Great. Um, so the next question is, is there any reason that certain hawks have longer middle toes? Yeah, so we talked about the peregrine falcon there. Um, in, in general, like kind of the, the form of most raptor feet is that the middle toe is a little bit longer. Um, it's, just a, it's just kind of like on your hand, how your middle finger is the longest. Um, it's, it's a mechanism that helps you to grip and hold on to things. Um, and having fingers that are different lengths and toes that are different lengths mean that you're gripping in different places. So every one, every talon isn't, isn't ending up in the same spot on the animal. So it gives you better purchase on that animal. Um, the peregrines in particular have that long toe, because like I said, when they fold their fist up, it sticks out and makes a pressure point. I think of if you're a, a, a person, I was going to say a woman, but I'm sure some men do this too. When you're walking through a parking lot at night to your car and you're kind of nervous, you'll stick your keys in your hand so the keys stick out between your fingers. And you're doing that. I think we all do that with the imaginary <laughs> belief that we can punch someone with that key and it's going to hurt really bad and they'll let us get away or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a similar thing, that extra toe sticking out further creates an extra strong like pressure point, like, like the tip of a nail. So when that bird hits, um, when the peregrine hits the bird, it's a really powerful blow. It's almost like, um, you know, getting hit by a nail or by some other um, 
you know, object that has that narrow point to, to focus the pressure. Alrighty, so I want to be mindful of everybody's time. So I'll just close it with this last question. Is there, um, like, where did the name Caloris come from? So Caloris comes from the scientific name for red-tailed hawks. Um, and for the life of me, I cannot remember it off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> but that's where his name comes from. And he was found in 1992 in California. Um, and so, like I mentioned, he collided with a barbed wire fence. That's why, I don't know if you can tell on one of his wings, there's one side has kind of whitish feathers towards the bottom of the wing and the other one doesn't. He has an amputation um, of part, partial amputation of one of his wings. So he can't fly. Um, Chloris and all the birds we have with us are here because we have a permit from the US Fish and Wildlife Service um, that allows us to use these birds for education. And in fact, they have to be used for education. That's part of the conditions of the permit. So this is a great way for Chloris to still do programs, but not have to travel too far or um, you know, put any sort of stress on his very old hawk body. All righty. So thank you everyone for coming to take a bite out of science. Um, we have a, another one coming up at the end of July. I believe it's the 28th. Yes, the 28th. And it's going to be kicking off migration season, talking about why some birds migrate and others don't. Um, so yeah, thank you again for coming. Sammy. And I hope to see you next time. Sammy. Yes. I have to make a quick disclaimer. I'm wrong. Caloris is not from the scientific name. Oh no. So I'm going to find out uh, what his name is from and then I'll tell Sammy and we'll do a social post about it. Sounds so like we'll it. get that right answer for you. <laughs> Thanks everybody. <laughs> yeah. So thank you for coming. Bye. Bye everyone.